Podcast. I am sitting down with Cameron Borg. Now, Cameron is a nutritionist, a practicing pulmonary technologist, and a podcaster on a bunch of very interesting health topics. Now, Cameron is probably among maybe five people in Australia who are actually delving deeply into light as health, light as medicine, and asking very important questions uh, to uncover exactly what is going on and how light is really uh, impacting our health. So Cameron, thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Max. That was a great introduction. I'm, I'm very chuffed to be on here. First time I've been invited as a guest. Yeah. So your, your podcast, the Ricky, Ricky Flow Nutrition Podcast is, was uh, the jumping off point for a couple of guests that I've had on. And my listeners will, will recognize the names like Scott Zimmerman, um, Stephanie Seneff. So, and your You've, you've really thought along very similar lines as I have and uh, very much enjoyed those those discussions. But let's let's start with your uh, just a brief background. How do you arrive to investigating these type of more interesting, complex and uh, unconventional health uh, path paths? Yeah, so I think like most people, I had um, I had a health problem of my own. You know, I was a very sickly child. Um, almost died at childbirth, you know, very traumatic birth, very sick as a child. Um, and, you know, I had, you know, asthma, eczema, you know, you name it. I was, I was a very unhappy, unhappy baby and eventually grew out of it as a teen, you know, um, sort of to, started to level out a little bit more, um, was never really super health conscious as most uh, teenagers, um, you know, tend to be. Um, and uh, I just, I got tangled up. Uh, with a, a staph infection that wouldn't go away. And, um, you know, it's just spent thousands of dollars at specialists who just had no idea what to do. And, you know, a friend of mine sort of um, put me on to uh, a couple of people. He, he got me to listen to a few podcasts and I started to get into nutrition thinking, you know, wow, isn't it amazing that what we eat can actually change our body's responses to things? And, uh, you know, I'd never been interested in you know, the things that I ate never really thought about how that impacted me. Um, but the idea that it did was very exciting to me. And I ended up sort of sorting out all my, my staph infection myself um, and realizing that, you know, these specialists and doctors don't always know the best thing to do. And often they're actually hamstrung by the fact that they, they live in such a, a small world uh, of ideas. And that really sort of opened opened the world of health up to me a little bit more. I got really passionate about nutrition, um, this whole food first model, you know, food is everything. That was sort of the world that I was living in at the time. Uh, and I went to university, I studied nutrition, uh, didn't learn a damn thing for three years, um, but got a certificate to say that somehow I'm, I, I know more now, um, which, you know, was kind of funny to me. But about halfway through my, my degree, I sort of cottoned on to these people talking about um, the different aspects of health and why food, you know, ranked quite low on, on the list of things that were most important. And uh, that's when I really started to figure out that these things that guys like Jack Cruz were talking about were really the most important um, places to be looking at first. And it sort of occurred to me as I read, you know, about 20, 25 books over the course of a semester when I was at uni. Um, you know, just because I'd come onto this wealth of knowledge and I just couldn't stop reading. And I realized, you know, over the last hundred years, we've encountered, you know, this rise in diseases that we've never seen before um, that can't be explained through genetics um, because genetics don't work like that. So clearly the environment is the primary factor in all of these. And I thought, well, if the environment is the primary factor, to explain the chronic disease epidemics, should we not look at the largest changes in the environment over the last century first? Shouldn't that just be the most logical starting point? And the unfortunate answer you get there is the electromagnetic environment that we're living in has changed. It's not even remotely the same. Um, and, you know, our eyes are funny because we can't see these 
these fields. We're not uh, aware that we're exposed to them, but clearly that is the biggest change in our environment over the last century. And light is included in that electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and that is when I really started to realize we, these changes in our environment have to be the first thing we prioritize. And food has changed over the last century. No one can doubt that. But the reality is, has it changed as much as our light environment? I think there's an argument there to say that it probably hasn't changed as much as our lighting environment. And um, that's where I sort of got interested in things that were beyond the scope of the conventional space. And I had to, you know, branch out. And uh, actually, you know, the reason I started the podcast was so I could speak to people that I couldn't get access to otherwise and ask them questions about my own health um, and sort of start to figure things out like that. And it's just, you know, that's a very brief version of the story, but um, that's essentially how I got to um, looking into all of these nooks and crannies, um, trying to be on the on the cutting edge as much as possible. Um, and I think that's mirrored by a lot of people who end up, you know, looking into these ideas. Definitely. The, the call or the, the statement that, the change in the electromagnetic environment and that we're exposed to is the biggest change. That is a fascinating statement. It's one that I agree with, but one that most people will really scratch their heads at. And the pathway that most, most kind of health, um, people with health interested uh, is very much dietary focused. And for a lot of people, they stop, I think they stop at the diet in terms of how can we improve health. So the changes that you refer to from a dietary point of view are, are obviously the introduction of refined seed oils and from the early 1910s onwards and the introduction of highly refined foods like carbs and and uh, sugar and also you know maybe perhaps the movement towards um, a vegan and plant-based eating and low fat eating uh, in the past 30 40 years um, and sorry, vegan more in the past maybe ten years. So explain these changes in the in the electromagnetic spectrum, and why do you think that is more significant than what has happened to our diets? Well, I mean, starting with light, what we've done essentially since the advent of the um, the incandescent bulb, which is basically running. I'm not a physicist or a, an electrical engineer, but bear with me. Basically, running a uh, current through a tungsten filament uh, at a high enough voltage so that it starts producing visible light. Now, to do that with a, with a filament, you actually have to run quite a bit through it to actually get visible light to come out because tungsten filaments are really good at generating long wavelength light, um, near infrared and infrared, which we don't see. So it's basically useless if you want to use it for vision. Um, but we realized somewhere along the way um, that that light was very inefficient for visual um, use. So there was this idea that, you know, well, we can't see it, so let's just remove it and make things more efficient, which I understand. Uh, it kind of makes sense in that way. Um, and we basically went down, you know, changing from, you know, incandescent bulbs to halogens to fluorescent tubes. And now we've, we've got to LEDs, which are hyper efficient. They're, they're phenomenal pieces of engineering. Um, but what we've done is essentially we've, we have removed 90% of the spectrum and we didn't even know it uh, because we can't tell. And because our eyes are so easy to trick, uh, you're lured into this sense of safety where, you know, a light is a light and a light is not a light, unfortunately. And, um, I have, I'm lucky enough to be sitting here right in front of one of Scott's bulbs, Scott Zimmerman's bulbs, where. You know, I'm, I'm being bathed with quite a bit of near-infrared, broadband near-infrared right now, but um, I'm, I know I'm the only person in Australia with this light bulb and it's illegal to own light bulbs, to, to purchase light bulbs like this in Australia and most European countries and uh, in, in the States and things like that. So light has fundamentally changed beyond recognition. It's just our eyes are not suited to understand that. Um, and that's a huge problem. So... Um, you know, I've been reading quite a bit of Nick Lane recently, um, who is one of my favorite writers. And um, in his book, The Vital Question, he really 
pins down this idea that this endosymbiotic event, uh, the use of a, what we now call a mitochondria, which is these old purple bacteria um, going in, inside of another single celled organism, that endosymbiotic event is so important uh, in, in what we are today. And fundamentally, our mitochondria are run by the influence of light. Uh, and conversely, not only run by light, but also run by the darkness. You know, you, you can't take on um, light without thinking about the darkness as well, because they're both as important as one another. And you could think of that as uh, an enormous departure in our electromagnetic spectrum as well. We no longer have true darkness anymore. We no longer have night. Uh, and that is a massive change. And that's on the circadian side mostly, but um, the effects of those um, short wavelength lights that we get in LEDs on the skin and in the eyes at night are also um, detrimental. Um, so just on the light side, we're experiencing an enormous amount of of shift, you know, beyond beyond what we what we could even think about, uh, and then we have the introduction of telecommunications, and you know we have things like, you know, I think the real there are a lot of people talking about five G, and I think that's important because five G does seem to be extremely de detrimental. Uh, you know, anyone who doesn't believe that, I mean, there's so many books out there. Uh, you know, the Invisible Rainbow, Arthur Furstenberg. Uh, overpowered by Martin Blank. Um, you, you go back and read all of Robert Becker and Andrew Marino's work, um, and you will understand very quickly that these even very, very uh, weak uh, electromagnetic fields have uh, tangible biological effects. Um, but I think really the most pernicious is Wi-Fi um, because it's everywhere. Uh, 5G is not everywhere at the moment. Um, perhaps that's what they're trying to do. Um, but Wi-Fi is just so pernicious. It's everywhere. And I think the effects of Wi-Fi are quite well documented uh, in, the, in the literature. Um, I, I know of uh, rat studies showing that the, the 2.4 gigahertz is damaging the islet cells of the pancreas. Um, and, you know, this, is, this makes a lot of sense when you think about um, type 2 diabetes and uh, metabolic syndrome you know, growing at exponential rates. Um, unfortunately, not many people are looking into this. Um, but, you know, we've, we're living in, on a world that no longer resembles our ancestors' world. Um, there's nowhere on, on this planet that you can escape the um, long radio wave communication signals, um, which is quite sad when you think about it, that we'll, we will never, you know, you don't, you don't, we, we don't want to be in a Faraday cage either because we actually need some, we need the native electromagnetic fields that are a result of the interaction between the sun and the Earth's atmosphere. Um, but, you know, finding that balance is extremely difficult. Um, and, you know, we've got high voltage power lines, cell towers, um, you know, satellites, phones in our pockets all the time, laptops, you know, you name it, anything that's got, you know, a battery in it is um, producing some sort of field. Uh, and if it's a phone, if it's a communication device, then it's not only producing the radio waves, it's producing the, the bi-directional microwaves as well. Uh, and all of these things have biological effects. Um, it would be very nice to think that, um, you know, the old story that if it's not thermal energy, then it doesn't matter. If it's not ionizing, then it doesn't matter, which is such a small-minded and myopic way of viewing um the way our bodies work, you know, we're electrical beings, you know, um, you know, we can pick up brain signals, heart signals from, you know, way outside the body. Um, and it would, I think it would be foolish to think that we're not being impacted by all the soup of electromagnetic fields that we're in. Um, unfortunately, you know, I do think that that's the biggest change, but it's, it's also the one that's, I guess, arguably the most difficult to, try and um, adjust and, and, and get as right as you possibly can um, because sometimes the answer is, you know, you have to, you have to move, you have to um, go somewhere else, you have to change job, you have to do these massive things. And um, unfortunately, most people, uh, for right or for wrong, aren't ready to make that step and that's completely understandable. Um, but it is important to acknowledge because it's quite easy to, you know, put the phone on airplane mode um, it's quite easy to switch everything off at night. 
you know, it's quite easy to go out to the box and put the kill switch and make sure you're sleeping with as little influence from these fields as possible. Um, so even though it's kind of like we'll never experience a world um, that is free of these non-native, these man-made electromagnetic fields, we can quite easily limit our exposure um, in our homes and in our workplaces. So I try not to be negative about these things because I do think we can make differences. And I think in some cases, the, the, the man-made electromagnetic fields are not as bad as some people say that they are, or at least I hope that that's the case. Um, but the reality is we can all make differences uh, quite easily in our homes and workplaces and just in our daily practices, you know, putting your phone away, you know, reading a book instead of, a, you know, being on the laptop. Um, all of these things are going to make a difference. Um, so I think that's fundamentally where I see this largest shift in the environment that, that we, are, we are living in now. Um, and I think it has extraordinary explanatory power with regard to what we're seeing with regards to health and disease. Um, but it's a very difficult topic to research. You know, not many people are funding this. As soon as you start looking into it, you end up like um, the Swedish researcher Ole Johansson, who was at the Karolinska Institute doing this work, and now he finds himself with no office. Um, I think he was called the biggest quack of the year a few years back in in Sweden. Um, you know, this guy's a, a serious researcher who is calling for uh, change in the laws, predominantly to protect children because they are the most susceptible to these um, these waves. So. You know, we're in a, we're in a, bit, in a bit of a tough spot with regard to researching the effects of this part of our environment. But uh, I think more and more people are beginning to understand that you know, keeping your phone in your in your bra or your or your front pocket, you know, there are there are pro there are most definitely risks associated with that. Um, so I think I think it's not a hard sell to to go that far, but to go further with what we're saying. Um, that's a little bit more of a difficult story to get across. Yeah, there's so much there, Cameron. And I have previously recorded with a bunch of guests who've, who've discussed this topic as well. And really, um, Tristan Scott's episodes are, are very important and, and informative. The change that you mentioned particularly, and I, and I like to put a date or a approximate date on it to really help people to understand, is the basically the late 1800s when and electricity was essentially um, invented and the, the light bulb, the electricity wars happened and then eventually um, there was widespread use of, of electricity. And previously that was when um, we had the first of this non-visible, this visible light at night that didn't come from fire, that didn't come from, from the moon. And that's kind of, that, that's really the before and after because prior to that time, prior to the invention of electricity, the electromagnetic spectrum that we all were bathed in was was natural. It was visible. It was sunlight during the day, including ultraviolet and, and infrared, and then um, basically not very little at, lot, at night. And then you had these these Schumann resonance um, and and a couple of very very uh, very faint um, long range radio radio frequencies. So if you think about that, um, and then you think about what we are sitting in today you know in a soup of radio frequency radiation from wi-fi 4g 3g 4g 5g 5g um, and then layering that on top of this artificial blue light because you, you you alluded to the point that um we've stripped out infrared well although incandescent and halogen was a, still a problem at night it was during the day at least it gave us some infrared which is what we need from the sun and, and that's that's what the sun is is providing so um yeah really really just stripping it back in the name of 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 efficiency the the point about um diabetes is very interesting and i think that because no one can see these these um non-native emfs the harm that they're done is i think um ascribed to food and it's ascribed to the carbs and the seed oils which are no doubt exacerbating the problem but the the fascinating implication is that perhaps it was the the light at night and the the Wi-Fi that was essentially setting up 
the metabolic ground or the the metabolic problem that the the food later exacerbates and i think anyone who's worked a shift work or has had to stay up all night will tell you that they crave carbs um, and sweet things the next morning so um it's it's a it's a very interesting thought to think that it's really our environment environmental electromagnetic signature environment that's really setting the stage for um what let the food later exacerbates yeah absolutely and that, that's what really gets me about um, the books like the China study by T. Colin Campbell, um, you know, he talks about the, the differences in cancer incidence between, um, the people eating the most meat and the people eating the least meat, uh, in China. And of course the people eating the most meat were the ones living in the cities and the ones eating the least amount of meat were in, you know, they were out in the, in the rural areas, you know, with firelight at night. And it's like, dude, there it's the completely different environment. It's not the meat you know, you're missing the whole point, you know, <laughs> and that's what really gets me about a lot of these, um, you know, these trends that you, that you, that you see, they completely dodge all of the big hitters in the environmental influences. You know, they're not talking about, well, clearly the people in rural areas had tighter circadian rhythms. Clearly they were getting more sunlight, um, and they were earthing more cause they were out in the rice paddy fields, you know, um, with no shoes on. Um, how can you not be taking this into a, into account? And of course, it all comes back to, um, you know, ideology. It's very easy. And, you know, the reason we, we grab onto food, this whole food first idea is because it's tangible. You know, we can track it, we can see it, we can taste it. It's there, it's tangible. We, we can understand it. We can grasp what's going on there. You know, the whole, this whole idea of calories in, calories out, super appealing because it's an equation. You know, that's not at all how it works. You know, we're an infinitely complex biological system. That's not how it works. You can't just, you know, break it down to, you know, X amount of calories. You're going to lose weight. You're going to be better. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's very easy to grab onto these ideas because they're not abstract, or at least they're minimally abstract. And I completely understand that because I fell for the same thing. You know, I was a, I was a vegan for 18 months. Um, and still recovering now, you know, this is like six, six years down the road. Um, you know, it's, it's dangerous, these, these ideas. And that's, that's why I try not to have, you know, I, I don't really engage that much in the diet side of things. Uh, you'll notice I barely have any podcasts with, um, people who talk about diet and nutrition because fundamentally I'm not all that interested. Um, and, uh, you know, I think. You know, I, I've stayed extremely quiet on the on the issue of seed oils, primarily because um, I don't. They're not. It's not food. So you know, you if you asked me, you know, is a chair healthy? I'd say, well, it's not food, so it's a bad question. I see <laughs> seed oils as the same thing. You know, cottonseed oil, canola oil. It's not food. So I, it's not part of the the conversation to me. Um, and you know, you can find studies that show increased uh, increased intake of omega-6 fatty acids relative to saturated fatty acids has, you know, better, uh, health outcomes, you know, so what, um, you know, no, none of the other environmental, um, conditions are taken into, are taken into account at all. So, you know, and that's, that's part of just having a discerning eye when you're looking at these types of things. And I think that's one of the great powers of looking at health and, and wellness and beyond in the way that we're sort of approaching it is because it's such a, a broad and encompassing view that you, you're, it's much more difficult to fall into bad patterns of thought when you're trying to encapsulate it into with everything else and trying to make it make sense with all of these environmental conditions. You sort of fortify yourself against bad ideas and, and ideology, which is one of the reasons why it's been so appealing to me because I've just been burned too many times by you know, crappy ideas that, you know, sound great on an Instagram reel or a TikTok, but, you know, they simply, it's just an, it's just an ideology. And uh, yeah, that's, that's what I really like about looking at it this, this way is because you think with logic instead of um, just being captured by ideas, everything has to pass through the litmus test of, well, does this make sense in the context of our evolutionary past? Does it make sense in the context of knowing 
how our cells work, you know, how a mitochondria drives a proton gradient. So much more difficult to have to be captured by bad ideas when uh, you're thinking about things at that level. Yeah, hundred percent. And to really uh, kind of emphasize the point, the implications of of not accounting for our light environment and this electromagnetic environment is that a lot of the findings that are in published literature with regard to dietary interventions, uh, they they might not and probably not um, valid because they haven't controlled for the light environment. They haven't controlled for changes in the light environment, things like the circadian variation in insulin sensitivity, um, in leptin sensitivity, um, all these um, very, very important um, modifiers of our physiology and our body's um, effect of things like um, of how we process food. They're not, they're not included. They're not accounted for. They're not controlled for. So it, and, and, and I see, I see people and, and other kind of influences and maybe, you know, so-called le- leaders in the, in the health space, you know, argue themselves blue with each other um, over some nuance or some specific idea going back and forth. Uh, and, you know, both of them, well, maybe one of them is sitting in natural light. The other one is under, you know, an isolated LED bulb. And it's, you know, it's the Dunning-Kruger effect written large because they, they simply simply have no idea um, what, what they don't know with regard to the, 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 the light environment, how that's implicating things. And um, it's not to sound arrogant, but, uh, you know, if you're kind of going to war with someone over the calories in, calories out model and, um, you know, making a, a, a hullabaloo and, and really, you know, embarrassing yourself for light. But, uh, you know, there's, there's this big kind of elephant in the room, which is um, that that person's that potentially, you know, exposed to artificial light 18 hours a day <laughs> and not respecting their circadian rhythm. And, and they don't understand that is, has meaningful effects on, on these biological processes that they're supposed to um, be an expert on. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's fascinating because, you know, you look at like the, the Hadza in Tanzania and, you know, they drink Coca-Cola and, uh, you know, every few weeks they'll get um, cornmeal dropped off and they will, they will stop hunting and gathering and they'll just eat, you know, what's been dropped off. Um, all, these, all these grains, they make like a porridge and they love the stuff because it's, you know, it's uh, quick carbs. It's, you know, it's tasty. That's what we're designed to, to uh, seek. And you know you track their microbiome, you track all of their all of their um, you know uh, the shifts in the the microbes that make up their gut, and it doesn't change. Why? Because they're they're have a look at their environment. You know they're on the equator, um, they're perfectly adapted to their environment. They're living exactly where they're evolved to. You know I'm not living where I'm where I'm evolved to. My mitochondria, uh, you know my mom is has um, you know heritage from the UK. Um, that's where my mitochondria are from, fundamentally. And I'm living 33 degrees south of the equator in Sydney, which arguably is probably better uh, for me um, to, to have that additional um, photonic energy uh, where I am. Um, but yeah, I mean, all of these things just don't get taken into account. And, and nutrition is basically a laughing stock in the field of scientific research. Um, it's, it is, it's just a laughing stock and there are for reasons you just covered, but you know, there are very few nutrition researchers who I take seriously. I think the only one I really like is David Rubenheimer. Um, and he has come up, he's put forward the protein leverage hypothesis, which is the closest thing you'll ever get to a physical law when looking at nutrition. It works all the way from Drosophila to human beings, you know, the, the, um, the nutritional geometry is exactly the same. And the big takeaway from his work is that uh, we are designed to prioritize protein because we cannot store amino acids. We can store fat, we can store carbohydrate, we cannot store protein, we cannot store amino acids. So we have to prioritize amino acids. You know, it's very simple. Again, this is, we're not talking scientifically here, we're just talking logically. You don't have to be a PhD researcher to get this. Um, you know, when you prioritize protein, hey, guess what happens? Satiety goes up, you know, lean muscle goes up, um, visceral fat goes down, you know, um, leptin and ghrelin get balanced more, more evenly. Uh, and this is just obviously 
you know, it's nothing can, taking into account all of the environmental considerations we were talking about before. But the, the point is, you know, this is not science. This is just logic at this point. And, you know, like you said, you got all these people arguing online about, you know, the, the science, you know, what study said what. You can, you can find studies that, you know, dispute any topic, you know. We've got um, researchers at Harvard saying fruit loops are healthy, for goodness sake. Um, you know, and nutri as far as nutrition research goes, I like to stick to, um, you know, basically the stuff that comes from the ancestral diets. You know, I think Western A. Price's work was really informative for me. Um, I don't know if you've read uh, Biochemical Individuality by Roger J. Williams. Uh, Roger Williams discovered vitamin B5 and his book Biochemical Individuality is a must read if you want to understand um, nutrition and, and why everyone's needs are so different. Um, you know, in that book, he, there are diagrams of, you know, how different uh, the anatomy of uh, different individuals can be. You know, even the way that the valves of the heart are sort of wired around, it can be vastly different, even in siblings. Um, you know, colon length, you know, the length of the GI tract can be markedly different between two individuals. And, you know, obviously someone who has a shorter GI tract is going to fare a, probably a little bit worse with more fiber than someone with a, a longer GI tract. And I think none of these nuances get taken into consideration because we like to think that, um, you know, where we're this, you know, average person, and of course, the, this hypothetical average person in, in a population has one breast and one testicle. So I would hardly you know, use that as a, as a gauge to see, to say what you should be doing. Um, and again, that's, it, that's what makes this way of looking at things from this sort of top down, you know, you want to look at the most important things first, you're going to get, it's that 80, 20 principle, you know, if you can do the 20% of the most important things, you'll cover 80% of your bases, and then you can start tweaking from there. Um, and yeah, that's, I mean, don't get me started on nutrition research, but, um, yeah, I mean, my thoughts are fundamentally around nutrition. You know, protein has to be prioritized. That's very clear. Um, don't eat seed oils because it's not food. Like, that's very simple. Don't eat food products because they're not food. Um, and I think beyond that, you know, if you're doing all of the other things right, you'll, you'll probably be pretty okay. Um, I, you know, I'm not even against grains and legumes and that kind of thing. Like, I eat everything. Uh, I, I don't like, probably just because I've been burned too many times with diet dogma, but I, I try not to buy into that. Um, but, you know, the reality is if you're following the basics, you know, just think logically. You know, you read Weston A. Price's book, you'll understand straight away what human beings are meant to be prioritizing roughly. Obviously, it differs around the world depending on availability. But um, what if you can apply those same ways of thinking you know, the, the food sort of, in some sense, takes care of itself. It's the other things that matter uh, quite a bit more. Yeah, and, and I'm just flagging the mitochondria. I want to talk about them um, at, at some point, but I'm glad that you brought up the Hadza and this this um, idea that they're essentially eating all kinds of foods that would be looked down upon in in the kind of health sphere, the dietary-centric health influencer sphere. Um and they would say that that's incompatible with the kind of health that we're observing from these people. But uh, Dr. Jacques Cruz is famous for saying that if you have those electromagnetic uh, givens dialed, if you have, if someone's grounded, if they're living in the latitude and the solar yield that their mitochondria are evolved for, uh, if they are respecting the light and dark cycle of their circadian rhythm, they can eat, so, to, to quote him, shit on a shingle uh, and still thrive. And um, I think recently one of the the a marathon runner who set some a very very impressive record was he was eating oatmeal. Um, mm. The the point was not that the food. It was, the point was that that guy was again in his niche. He was in an, the environment that suited his uh, biology and his his mitochondria. So yeah. the uh, and I'm just going to make a point, and I ha I have been making this point maybe for for the past um, eight months because. Uh, I think it's important, and that is 
Dr. Paul Saladino, who started as a, as a pure carnivore and then eventually transitioned to adding fruit and honey because he suffered, um, you know, adverse um, effects on his serum, his electrolytes. He had symptoms with um, related to low electrolyte levels and um, perhaps even flagging testosterone and androgen levels. And he fixed those by adding in local seasonal fruit and honey. But what, and, and I guess this was used as justification in, in terms of his narrative for saying that everyone should um, eat fruit and honey and we shouldn't be uh, doing a ketogenic diet. And that is, is, is ridiculous and it's a, a complete generalization and ignoring the fact that his move from a higher latitude to the equatorial um, Costa Rica um, prompted and demanded that he in, include those foods to, to correctly balance his his electrolytes and and to have a, a insulin spiking throughout the day because it, it was ancestrally and, and evolutionarily appropriate. So I, I really want to add that because this is the message that no one is getting and people are saying a, a kind of setting up their their weapons and they're digging their trenches along these dietary uh, wars and and battle lines when um no no they're not making the distinction that our electromagnetic environment our mitochondrial biology the the latitude the temperature the environment the season is what is going to dictate what uh, is the optimal diet um and appropriate food inclusion for for you yeah i mean try doing the paul saladino thing in oslo you know, not going to happen, not going to work. Um, first of all, I mean, the weird thing is you can source all of those foods um, all throughout uh, those northern parts of the world, which is potentially something we could talk about. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just share briefly the thing that really broke, that really um, made me stop being a vegan. And I was, I was pretty hardcore into it. Like I was hook, line and sinker. And it was the the realization that you know you have a look at all these places over the world the closer you are to the equator generally speaking the less saturated fat they're eating and the further away you go the more saturated fat they're eating like have a look at italy what are they what uh, fat do they use in sicily you know they use olive oil what do they use in rome they use butter what do they use in the north it's called the lard belt have a look at india all the vegetarians are at the south the further up you go you get ghee and the further up you go, they start cooking with animal fat. You know, this it's built into their, their religion and their culture there as well. Like they understood that the type of fats that you eat change the um, construction of the membranes of the cells. And why that's important, I, I would love to speak to people about um, why membrane fluidity is important and how it changes and why um, it has to change with uh, varying latitude. Um, but you know, these cultures figured it out because they had to. If they didn't figure this out, they just would have died. If there was a vegan culture that came about, um, you know, in Finland, they would no longer exist because they couldn't do it. Um, so all of these things were meticulously figured out through evolution because it had to be by definition. And that's what I, as soon as I started to realize that this stuff is like nature decides nature decides you know we don't really we have a say in it now because of our big fat brains um but that's not really helping us in any way um and that was that was really the point where i had to sit back and go wow this this whole vegan story just does not make sense it simply doesn't make sense um and i i've been teaching a class um to a group of you know 20 year olds about um health and wellness and i show them a picture uh in norway where they have the, the annual cod harvest, and it's just tens of thousands of cod hung up to dry on these massive racks. And, you know, I use that as a point to say, like, nature decides what they did, because without the cod, they didn't have enough UV radiation to synthesize vitamin D. There literally would be, be no cultures that far, that far north without seafood. It, it could not happen. And this connection that they have and of course at the time they probably didn't know exactly why they were doing that and why that was so important but they figured it out and i think the fact that they figured it out but didn't know precisely why is actually probably a good thing because have a look at what we've done i mean back when rickets was a big problem we knew it could be cured and prevented with cod liver oil 
Now, we didn't know why, but we didn't need to know why. It worked. So we used it. And because, like I said, because of our big fat brain, we wanted to know more. We wanted to know precisely what it was. So instead, eventually we, we figured out, you know, it was vitamin D that, we, that was the anti-rachitic factor of the cod liver oil. So we isolated it and then they give vitamin D. But of course, you know, we've, we've missed the forest for the trees here. You know, the, the cod liver oil itself had the complement of vitamin A in it as well and DHA and EPA. So the, I almost think, you know, our desire to know precisely what is going on at all time is actually of detriment to us because we miss, we, we zoom in too far and we can no longer even understand what it is that we're trying to figure out anymore. And I think that's why looking back at cultures that, that knew but didn't know that they knew precisely. Um, I remember reading, um, I, can't, I think it was um, Synchronicity by Carl Jung, and he wrote about his visit to an African tribe. And every morning right before the sun comes up, they all get up and they spit into their hands and they put them out to the to the rising sun and it, of course it was a superstition that they had to they had to do that to make sure the sun would rise the next day otherwise the sun would get angry at them now i think they're a lot smarter than we are because they they somehow realized that that had to be ingrained in their culture for them to be uh to to operate optimally and the fact that we we know more than them in quotes, but don't get that right. I think is a real sign that sometimes it's better to just know that it works, but not to ask specifically why, but just to trust that nature got it right because nature did get it right by definition. It's that cultural, cultural evolved practice, which I, I refer to often. And I think Western yeah. Price had various examples of that that he noticed in the Solomon Islands they had rituals where the tribe would bang a drum at, at dawn everyone would get up everyone would would essentially be dancing and humming um, yeah. uh, as they watched the sunrise and and you can analyze it with this scientific lens that you and I are talking about and they're grounded they're um, getting morning circadian programming in their eye they are humming they are you know they're getting good activation of, of their um you know pulmonary system everything yeah. that you, you know tick all the boxes of an ideal morning routine from health optimization blogger <laughs> or, or advice and they're, they're nailing but the point is as you so eloquently said cameron is that they they worked that out and there is i, I agree there's a certain intelligence of of getting to the right answer without knowing the, the details and i think um, if you've ever read Nassim Taleb, he talks about Fat Tony, uh, and uh, Fat Tony is a, is a Brooklyn, New York character who um, has no formal school education, but um, he, you know, he's extremely successful because he's worked out through a process of of cultural Darwinism um, the, the 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 way to thrive and and to succeed. So I, I really think that the siloed um, approach of modern science and modern specialists really gets in the way. And, and you look at what people like da Vinci achieved, um, they were generalists. They, they were, he was a generalist. He was able to span these domains and therefore draw connections, see patterns that no one else was seeing. And look, you can look at um, someone like Dr. Jacques Cruz, same thing. Um, the, the more, I think, uh, ability that we have to see across these and through these um, these individual specialties, the, the better we have. We're, we're more likely to be able to see the whole elephant rather than just you know hold the trunk um, and and say that it's a tree, or hold the tail and say that it's um, that it, it's a tree. I um I also wanted to get your thoughts, and, and I think you you really um, nailed it with with regard to that that description of of um, kind of access to food and what's local. And I've, I've come to the personal thought, and, and maybe I get your thoughts on this, that the reason why carnivore diet is, seems to be so effective for people in, in the modern age is because they're so disconnected from their this environmental and electromagnetic um, niche that we evolved in that um, and which, and the circadian cycle is regulating things like gut permeability. It's regulating um, enterocyte or gut cell turnover. Um, and my my thought is that the further away you are from your natural environment 
with regard to circadian rhythm and, and light environment and um, EMF environment, the more that carnival is essentially facultatively required because it is the least um, antigenically provocative from a food toxin point of view. And if your um, environment is so um, unsuitable, then you essentially need to be held together um, by by the lowest um, provo- lo- lowest um, toxicity diet. And again, not to um, I'm I'm one of the biggest advocates of carnival because it is such a pr- uh, powerful healing modality, especially in in the first months of of healing severe metabolic autoimmune disease. But the point is that um, if someone has to be maintained on that protocol, to me that is telling me that they're disrespecting their light environment, they're disrespecting their um, mitochondrial haplotype, they're disrespecting their um, the grounding and everything else that we've just talked about. So yeah, what what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I I wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, I think, you know, it makes makes me laugh um, most of the time when I think about people talking about gluten as a, as a big problem. Um, you know, I can eat gluten all day long and it doesn't seem to bother me. And, you know, I've had gut issues my entire life, but I, I really think that the big changes are these ones uh, that we were talking about before. And, you know, I, I think there are a lot of people out there who really benefit from it. And I think part of that is just the sheer nutrition you get by eating meat. I mean, it is unmatched. Like how many people are not getting an adequate amount of zinc, for instance, and then you start eating meat every day. Hey, all of a sudden you've got one of the most critical nutrients in enough abundance to get stuff done. Um, you know, I think one of the reasons it's, it seems to be do, seems to do well is just because it's got lots of nutrition in it. Um, and that's why you see this really um, fast. Well, sometimes not not fast, but generally you see a, a, a quick improvement um, in, in health when you when you even not even going carnivore, but just consuming more meat than, than normal. Um, I think just pu- for purely from a nutrition aspect you're probably just getting more uh and and that more that's getting you up to an an evolutionarily appropriate level of a lot of these ones that tend to be missing uh even even things that aren't nutrients like choline uh for instance um you know uh, sort of like an honorary b vitamin but one that seems to be left out a lot um you know there are a lot of different things in meat that just generally are missing from most people so i think that's a big that's a big part of it I think I know you. You just uploaded your episode with Gabor, um, and you've spoken to um, uh, Dr. Boris. Yeah, uh, I think this is another big part of it. I mean, um, I am. We'll we'll get on to. I, I actually let's let's talk about a little bit about deuterium, um, just because I have a bit of a personal story with it that um, that I haven't shared before. But um, after starting to read Gabor's work a bit more seriously uh, last year. A good friend of mine told me um, that his father's bladder cancer had come back and it was invading his kidneys and they wanted to take his kidney out, one of his kidneys out. And he he knows that I'm into all of this kooky stuff. So he said, you know, they want to take it out in six weeks. What do you think we should do? I said, I'm going to get you some deuterium depleted water and, you know, I emailed Gabor and he got back to me straight away. He he is just, I mean, being a being in the position that we are, it, it's quite overwhelming how much uh, of of these guests' lives, you know, they they give to us. And I emailed him asking asking him for uh, advice about what to do with my friend's dad, and he emailed me back straight away and said, "Here's what you need to do for six weeks. Let me know how it goes." Um, we got him doing a deuterium depletion protocol and um, he told the doctors and they were like, you're crazy. Like you have no idea what you're doing. You're going to, you know, you're going to make things really, really bad. And um, he said, no, no, this is what I want to do. I don't want you to take my kidney. Anyway, he demanded they go in and check again. And they said, we're not doing that. And he, he demanded. So they eventually uh, agreed. And six weeks after doing a deuterium depletion protocol, they went back in and they said it was a miracle. There was nothing there to biopsy. Wow. And, you know, it's, it, was, it was the best moment I've had doing all. It made all of this stuff so worth it. Um, but it also made me quite angry. Like, why, why am I figuring this out? 
Like, why is some, you know, some kid uh, who doesn't have a PhD, doesn't have any real science background, like, doesn't know anything, why am I the one to help make this happen? And the doctors are like, well, it's just a miracle. Um, you know, it's, it was such a great moment, but at the same time, it was, you know, it was very bittersweet. But uh, I think that just highlights the importance of, you know, how tightly regulated our bodies are. Um, you know, um, I'm going to assume that your listeners know um, the basics of deuterium. And essentially, this, the ratio of deuterium to hydrogen in the body, uh, although it seems like it can't make that much of a difference, you know, you're thinking one in every 6,600 hydrogens is a deuterium. How can that possibly have an effect? But you know, nature doesn't work in a linear fashion. You know, biology is not a linear machine. Um, and this deuterium factor is a really big problem because, you know, a Coca-Cola Coca -Cola has like 200 parts per million, whereas the water here in Sydney is like 152 parts per million. Um, and, you know, carbohydrate foods concentrate more deuterium. And arguably, evolutionary diets were much lower in deuterium content um, than they are today. And I think that's one of the big benefits of eating more meat is not only are you bringing in fewer deuterium relative to hydrogen, you're also bringing in the enough building block in the form of particularly saturated fats, which we know produce more mitochondrial deuterium depleted matrix water. Uh, we've known this for Gee, probably like 80 years, I think. I saw the paper in Nature from like 1940s. Um, you know, we've known this for a very long time that saturated fats make the mitochondria more hydrated. And not only that, it's hydrated in the best possible way because it's actually hydrogen. It's not D2O, it is hydrogen, which I, th I don't even think we've scratched the surface of why deuterium is so important in biology. Um, and obviously we need it, you know, we, we can't grow without it. It's very important, but keeping it in the right ratio, um, you know, I've, I've become much more convinced that that's, you know, a really, really critically important part, um, of, of this story that we're telling, because I think it fundamentally con connects back to the light story, because just like there's a latitude gradient with UV light, there's a latitude gradient with deuterium on the planet. So um, and I don't think this has been proved. I'd love to know, but um, I, I suspect uh, it seems logical to me that um, the light that's present on the equator helps balance the elevated deuterium content of their food and drink. Um, so, I mean, it makes sense to me that the more sunlight that you're getting, the more you're giving your body the opportunity to balance that DH ratio. And I think that's super, super important because it's at it is at the foundational level. I mean, you can't really get more foundational than protons, neutrons, and electrons. Um, and that is fundamentally what the body is built on. Um, so I think that's another big reason of, of why these low carb ish diets tend to really do well. Um, but you know, I do, I do have concerns with uh, diets that are, that are purely meat. And I think just from a logical point of view, uh, you have to watch things like potassium, magnesium, and calcium. Um, you know, they're all important and, you know, they, they can be difficult to get in, in the, in the right quantities. And of course you're taking, you have to take into the account that, um, into account that, you know, you're not living in an, in an environment that your ancestors did. And, you know, sometimes, and in, like you said, this is, this is probably exactly why Paul made his shift um and did it quite discreetly as well uh if if i'm correct uh um uh, which i think happens a lot in the health space people not telling um their audience that they're not doing well and just pretending that it's all fine on the outside um but yeah i think that that's another thing to consider and you know i worry about people who you know can't have a tomato without getting a reaction like clearly that's clearly something's going wrong there and, you know, ideally what you'd be able to do is you'd be able to eat, you know, all sorts of things and not have reactions to it. I understand that there are people out there who, you know, that's, that's going to be a much longer journey, but, um, I think it speaks to the fact that, you know, 
maybe there's something deeper going on that needs to be addressed if you can't have an eggplant or you can't, you know, have a piece of sourdough bread. Perhaps there's something a bit deeper going on. And, you know, touching on the gluten thing again, it makes me laugh because I, I suspect gluten is one of a countless number of things that modulate intestinal permeability. Um, you know, like one of my favorite papers um, talks about how we basically know less than 1% of the molecules that are in food. Like we just don't know what, what all these molecules do. Um, and it, it seems absolutely ridiculous to me to think that gluten is the only one that does that sort of thing with the intestines, uh, with, with those gap junctions, you know, uh, modulating intestinal permeability. I suspect all foods do that to some degree in different ways. And we just don't understand why that is or the consequences of that. Yeah. And, and, and my personal opinion is that when it comes to gluten, and this is what mutual guest Dr. Stephanie Seneff has talked about to both of us, is that it's probably the glyphosate and the glyphosate contamination of these foods that is really acting as a force multiplier to inhibit and, and your um, intestinal permeability and uh, disrupt the gut microbiome. And that's kind of really making a, a massive difference. But the again to emphasize, it, it's it's really a healing protocol that I that I think is the the biggest reason why everyone benefits on carnivore. And I, I really treat it like that. I think it's a it's a therapeutic tr um, healing protocol. But um, we want to get people back to a state where they don't fall in a heap if they eat, um, as you said, <laughs> a piece of you know yep. fermented food, or they they eat yep. a, you know a piece of not not encouraging it, but the, the, as you rightly said, there should be a reason why we should be able to tolerate a little bit of something else. While it's not optimal, um, it shouldn't um, send us to you know in bed for two days, which is what exactly. it sounds like it does to to a lot of people. So being held together with sticky tape and bubble gum. I'm so glad you brought up deuterium, and I really agree. I think the benefit of low carbon carnivore is the fact that it's it's a deuterium depleted diet. Um, probably number one, and second, it's providing that. Uh, surplus of micronutrients that you talked about and really this idea that people are coasting on a, a subclinical or, or in some cases clinical but mostly subclinical uh, micronutrient deficiency and they've got they're having rate limiting um, enzymatic steps in their body that are not being met when they simply don't have the correct b vitamin trace mineral whatever it is so simply putting someone on a, on a very very high meat, meat diet you you're filling in all those gaps so that there's no deficiencies that are essentially um slowing down the system on a rate limiting point of view the the interesting anecdote that you shared about your friend's father i suspect that they would have re-imaged him and found that the the primary or whatever the, the tumor they were looking at had shrunken and um, for those who are not unfamiliar i would really encourage listening to my my episode with dr gabor shomlai and listen to to cameron's episode with him and he, he's done a couple of podcasts recently but and um, the, the fascinating implication is that reducing the, the concentration of deuterium in the body with a deuterium depleted water, water protocol is an is something you can do in addition to it doesn't replace um, a standard oncological uh, therapy and i really want to emphasize that point no one's advocating i will i will just add um that was the only thing we changed. I didn't speak at all to him about changing his diet. He, he eats a relatively standard diet. The only thing that was changed was the water. That's it. Interesting. And, and, and that was the progress that was made. So imagine what you could do by, you know, really maxing out, um, you know, living, living as circadian friendly as possible, getting, getting all the light that you need. We know that extends lifespan, even with people who have terminal cancer, um, you know, getting great sleep, eating great food, all of those things on top of just getting the deuterium ratio right. Yeah. Um, and, and and let's talk about that because it comes down to mitochondria. And in my episode with Thomas Seeger, he described people who are having um, re their progression of their various cancers was basically slowed down by, by a practice of, of regular ice bathing. So what I think um, it would be difficult for someone to make sense of this unless they are putting the mitochondria at the center of their disease model, which is what um, you're advocating for and I'm advocating for. And suddenly it all makes, it starts to make sense. And uh, the hypothesis or in science, we have hypotheses, we try and disprove them with, you know, observed findings. But um, you, the strength of your hypothesis is how well it can explain the observed phenomena. And uh, if you can put all these pieces together and realize that you can 
heal people or you can reverse cancer or slope cancer progression with fasting, with sunlight exposure, with a low deuterium diet and, and water, um, with cold exposure. And you can explain that because it, they're, they're all optimizing mitochondrial function. And we know that cancer is is a mitochondrial problem at its, at its core. So may, maybe talk about mitochondria as you as you think about them um, and, and uh, how it's relevant to what we've just mentioned. Yeah, so, I mean, mitochondria are this absolutely fascinating thing. Um, probably the, the event, the endosymbiotic event, probably likely only took place once. It is that unlikely. And, you know, there are people out there who suggest that there will, there, in the entire universe, there's a chance that life like us doesn't exist because that, that chance of a, uh, an archaea swallowing uh, an old purple bacteria and then and then them able to live symbiotically and reproduce that event is so statistically unlikely that it probably only ever happened once and that is where all multicellular life came from you know it's it is phenomenal to think about that in endosymbiotic event is the most important thing that happened in in uh, life on this planet because every multicellular organism came from that event and if you if interestingly if you took all of the melanin all of the heme all of the pigment out of the body we would be purple we would glow purple because our mitochondria are old purple bacteria and we would glow purple and we do glow purple uh, it's just we can't see it because it's so faint and we have all of these other pigments on us as well um, but fundamentally the ability to inside the cell drive a proton gradient and essentially create a battery which is separating the positive and negative charge and then using that potential to spin the atpas to create energy there's arguments to say that that's not how energy is created but bear with me i'll stick with i'll stick with atp is the energy currency and we can maybe flesh that out later but that that ability to drive a proton gradient allowed a uh, life to depart those deep um, sulfurous hydrothermal vents where the hydrothermal vent was actually an analog of what we have in the mitochondria now it the those vents drove a proton gradient and allowed those life forms to basically have an external mitochondria the fact that we have them in every single cell except our red blood cells as far as i'm aware there's always an exception but the fact that we have those um, in every single one of our cells, and it is the, the defining factor of multicellular life. It's the defining factor. You, you can't move past that. Like I said before, it should be the first thing we focus on because it is what sets us apart. And the mitochondria are fundamentally receptive to the things in our environment. Uh, I think they're very receptive to non-native electromagnetic fields. They're certainly very receptive to light. And I think uh, a lot of that is coming from near-infrared light interacting with cytochrome C, which is where water is made. It's kind of weird to think about that too. Um, mitochondria make water. I think if you went around on the street and you said to people, do, do human cells make water? Do they make H2O? People would say, well, no, that's ridiculous. We have to drink water. But of course we do generate H2O and we do that at cytochrome C, which is this uh, part of the respiratory complex that seems to interact quite strongly with the wavelengths of light that are in the red and near infrared. And that is what's helping to drive that proton gradient, uh, which is why red light therapy seems to do so well for almost any condition that it's used on. Um, I think the fact that red light therapy seems to um, benefit the function of mitochondria is just a sign that we are no longer living in enough natural sunlight to satisfy our need. And much like someone with a complete zinc deficiency would benefit from a zinc supplement, someone with an absolute red and near infrared deficiency benefits from a, a red light panel. I think it's just a symptom of the fact that we're not living uh, in the sun enough. I'm not saying red light therapy is bad. I think it can be really, really useful. But I, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that it seems to just be a sign that uh, this, it's a symptom of us living indoors the same way that um, high vitamin D 
is a proxy marker for living outdoors. And that's why it seems to be so, uh, that's why it correlates so well with better health outcomes. Whereas when you give vitamin D supp supplements, you don't see those health outcomes. I think it's the same thing here with the red light. The reason it's making the mitochondria work really well is because they are begging for it. They're saying, please let me out in the sun all day because I need it. I've, I've evolved outside all day. I need the near infrared all day. And when you're inside all day, you're fundamentally gasping for that because the mitochondria aren't flicking over. They're not driving that proton gradient. And over time, as we age, as the heteroplasmy of the mitochondria increases, which is essentially saying that the mitochondria gradually look less and less like mitochondria. Um, they, they sort of lose their form and they become leaky. And I think there's a very good argument to be had that aging is a, a direct consequence of leaky mitochondria. You know, forget leaky gut, leaky mitochondria is the big problem. Um, and I think the, the light story with mitochondria is fundamentally connected to that. Um, but also mitochondria are filled with water. And if you have a look, I mean, this is why I love Bob Fosbury's work so much. Have a look at the water absorption bands. You know, you have all of these really high peaks of absorption in water in the infrared range, not so much in the near infrared, but beyond the near infrared into the infrared, that's when you see water is the primary chromophore of the body. It's the primary light absorber of the body. And these long wavelengths, I suspect, are doing crazy things to the hydrogen bonding networks in water. They are creating coherent domains and changing the structure of water um, and making it do work, essentially. Um, I don't know if you've read um, Gerald Pollack's book, Cells, Gels, and the Engines of Life. No, I haven't read that one. So everyone talks about um, the fourth phase of water, which is a phenomenal book. But to me, Cells, Gels, and the Engines of Life is the best it's way better than the fourth phase of water because what it explains is how our bodies basically shift the structure of water from bulk water, H2O, to this crystalline water to actually do work. And there's great diagrams in there explaining how things like mitosis, the protein filaments that do the cytokinesis in mitosis are fundamentally driven by where the the charge is on the water around the proteins themselves. So the body's ability to shift between bulk and structured water is super important because that's what's doing the work. That's what's creating these pro protein folding because at every site of a protein, it's completely surrounded by water. And depending on what the charges on that water, depending on what the charges are around that um, protein molecule, it folds differently. And I think that's where a lot of people get a bit tripped up in my view with the whole water story is that they think everything needs to be structured all the time. And I think what it is, is the body needs to be able to shift between different crystalline structures, different bond angles. And that goes back to May Wan Ho's work, which is a little bit above my head when I was trying to go through her work because she's very hardcore and that book was very difficult to read. But I think the bond angles the structure in the water itself and being able to shift between those two is actually what's more important than just having structured water, structured water, structured water all the time. And I think what is shifting the water in the mitochondria and in the cytosol and all the way through the extracellular matrix and the ground substance is everything from, you know, the DC current that's running through the body to the electromagnetic fields that we're exposed to, to the light that we're exposed to. And I think that's shifting the water in the mitochondria and doing lots of different things that we would consider, you know, work done in the cell. Um, I think a lot of it's done by the water's capacity to shift and do all of these different things. It's like a shapeshifter. And it's where it ends up is dependent on all of these other um, uh, environmental influences. And that's really where I think life sort of, coalesces is this interaction between water and light you know and that's what we see in the mitochondria the mitochondria makes light makes water and it accepts light to do so um, and maybe that's a bit oversimplified but those are just some of the things that were running through my head 
Um, I don't often get the chance to ramble about mitochondria, um, but yeah, you can see how passionate I am about them. Yeah, it's it's a great description, Cameron. Anyone who's followed my work and has listened to my Jack Cruz series um, would hear what Jack said was very, very similar to what you've described. It's essentially the same idea in in said differently. Uh, this idea that the life is, you know, the stage is is water, but the actors are, are light, or vice versa. I can't remember which um, way he put it, but essentially that they they're so integral integrally um, linked that you, if you mess with the light signals, then as you've mentioned, the the structuring water that is probably having all these incredibly complex effects on regulating our our. Um, our, our biological processes gets disrupted, and and similarly, if you have things that um, are disrupting the water, and, and Gerald Gerald Pollock has shown things like glyphosate, the herbicide glyphosate disrupts that structuring, and um, absence of of infrared light from the sun um, is going to interfere with that. Anything that disrupts mitochondrial function and prevents them from making water is also going to disrupt that. Then then people get sick. So it's it is really so fascinating because we're taking it down a level. We are analyzing in um, health on, on such a more fundamental level than, um, you know, ha- what, what unique nutrients are in this organ meat. Again, not saying that that's not important, but um, this is so much more um, fundamental. It, it links, and you mentioned um, Professor Robert Fosbury, and he is has been doing a lot of work on light, especially with regard to mitochondria and, and infrared light. But Scott Zimmerman, who you mentioned as well, is is a very, very interesting researcher who is doing the same, um, talking about the same similar things. Both of those are have really shown us and emphasized how important infrared light is for melatonin production in, in, in the mitochondria. And this idea that it's the, the if you think of the, about the mitochondria as an engine, the coolant is the is the melatonin, which is mopping up all of these reactive oxygen species that get generated as as a function of the mitochondria's normal action. But the red light um, uh, and the infrared light is like the the lubrication, and that's helping the ATPA spin. So when you taking this all the way back to the beginning of the conversation, when you change the reality of our existence, which was outdoors the whole time during 12 hours of daylight if you're on the equator. Um, if you put that person or put someone inside under an artificial blue LED, you are removing one of the most critical nutrient, light nutrients, which I like to call it, which is in- infrared light. And, and you know, we can blame that on, on, on food, but it's so obviously um, a deficiency of, um, of a nutrient that is non- it's, it's a non-visible um, you know, wavelength of ele- electromagnetic uh, radiation. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I confess my love for Bob and Scott. Um, I think they are just some of the most inspirational guys. Um, and, you know, they've kept in contact with me, even though they, you know, they didn't have to. But these are guys who have come completely out of their own fields, out of their own fields of expertise. And com- in my eyes, completely revolutionized the field. I mean, I would probably consider Scott the melatonin expert in the world uh, right now. And this guy is as humble as it gets, completely outside of his field. Um, and ha- same with Stephanie Seneff. I mean, she's a computer scientist, for goodness sake, and she's the leading, uh, she, she's really carrying the torch of um, with probably people like Carrie Gillum um, of... Rachel Carson, you know, uh, I just finished reading Silent Spring, um, you know, so glyphosate, unbelievable. Glyphosate toxicity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, like all of these guys have come way outside their field and they stress the importance of interdisciplinarity. Um, you know, like I remember Bob speaking to me about him going and um, he's an honorary professor with Glenn Jeffrey in his lab at um, University College London. And, you know, Glenn you know, t- tussling with this idea of, you know, you know, why does 670 nanometers work? You know, why is 670 nanometer red light? Um, why does it seem to be so important? And, and Bob says, well, you know, that's the wavelength that plants photosynthesize at. And Glenn goes, well, no, I didn't know that. And, you know, him explaining all of these phenomena, these for that only an astrophysicist would know, help make sense of how the retina works. 
and Scott coming from an optics engineering um, point of view, having a look at the, the folds of the brain saying, well, that's a light trap. Like I know that any day of the week, that's a light trap. You know, that's designed to funnel near infrared light deep, deep, deep within the body. It's completely obvious. Now, a biologist is not going to pick up on that stuff. And that's why it's so, so important that, you know, we, we encourage people outside of their field to, you know, start thinking about these ideas because the breakthroughs that those guys have had, and, you know, I feel super blessed that I've sort of introduced them and now they're working together. Um, I hope they publish a paper together so I can say I sort of played a role in that. Um, but, you know, these guys are doing incredible work, um, you know, and uh, Glenn and Bob figured out how a reindeer's eyes work, um, you know, in, in, the, in the Arctic when the blue is so intense that it should basically completely fry the eye. Um, they figured out why it doesn't. And only a combination of an astrophysicist and, an, and a professor of ophthalmology could have figured that out. And um, the implications of the things that they are discovering, and this is not published, but Bob has said that they are looking into these, the idea that near-infrared light is helping the mitochondria overcome kinetic barriers in, um, in generating that proton gradient. Now, we have to remember that it is, it is an evolutionary given that we are exposed to near infrared light all day long. It's a given. That is, that's the bare minimum. So it stands to reason that our body would have said, uh, evolutionarily, our biology would have said, well, that energy, that photonic energy is there all day. So we might as well use it to make this kinetic reaction easier. And then, of course, as soon as you take it away, the mitochondrial function suffers immediately because what is a given is no longer there. And I think that's what's so scary when you think about it is that, you know, even if we are outside all day, that's the bare minimum. Like that, that is reaching our evolutionary bare minimum. That's not like, oh, look at me, I'm so healthy. You've just reached, you know, a normal level. You haven't excelled. You know, that's just the reality of what we're supposed to be exposed to. And regardless of where you are on, uh, on the planet, uh, that near infrared is coming through, rain, hail, or shine. That's the beautiful thing about water is that it's not a strong absorber of near infrared like it is infrared. So all these clouds up above all the water in the atmosphere, the near infrared just funnels its way down and it hits the earth. It might go back up and come back down, but the near infrared is always there no matter where you are. So even if you're like me and my skin can't tolerate um, a, a, com a full summer's day outside, I, I will burn. It'll be a little bit too much for me, but I still need to be outside because I still need the near infrared. I don't have to be directly in the sun, but I need to be sitting in the shade, absorbing all the near infrared because that is the evolutionary given. That is the bare minimum. And I'll be the first to admit, I don't reach that bare minimum because, you know, fundamentally I'm, I live indoors. I work indoors. Uh, I'm outside as much as I can possibly be. Um, but that's an important thing to remember is that that is a bare minimum. That is what our body expects. That is what the mitochondria expects to happen uh, is this chronic exposure. Yeah, great, great explanation, Cameron. And the problem that Scott is trying to solve, which I think is this next frontier, is how to get near infrared back into indoor environments and his work with making bulbs that emit a near infrared band, a broad near infrared band at the same time as being reasonably energy efficient to comply with uh, this myopic government policy <laughs> that uh, is admirable, but it's a problem that's going to need to be solved by multiple people. And I'm in, in discussion with uh, some you know engineers to think about how, whether we can design things like a, a photobiomodulation panel with multiple near infrared and red wavelengths to to basically help people put it in indoor office environments for people who can't set up outside or can't set up in front of a window to, to really get this um, infrared light back in but let, let, let's pivot and let, let's let's finish this conversation on, on on the sun because it is a topic of interest of, of both of us and the reason why it's so important is because narratives from uh, that are, are quite old, but particularly um, emphasize um, in the past maybe 20, 30 years 
is that the sun is is harmful and i think the maybe the the culprit entity behind that is the dermat <laughs> the dermatology profession and i'll say that um because this episode will have aired after i've released my conversation with professor richard weller and um before someone you know attacks me for attacking the dermatology prof profession i'm not going to say anything that um the esteemed professor weller hasn't already said uh which is that the dermatologists have been misguided in terms of essentially recommending everyone stay in, inside a cave to quote him and take vitamin D pills uh, based on the fact that not only do we need this infrared light for being outside, but we actually also need uh, UV and we do need um, these balanced wavelengths of, of visible light too. So, so talk about your thoughts about the sun, about tanning and about maybe the narrative shift that has to change in order for us to uh, get this critical light nutrient back into people's lives. Yeah, I'll just finish um, my thought from the previous question about melatonin. Sure. Um, the reason melatonin is going up when you're exposed to long wavelength light, particularly in the near infrared, is because the mitochondria are working better. And when the mitochondria work better, they're producing more reactive oxygens. That's just the byproduct of more efficient mitochondrial function. And melatonin, much like DHA, probably came around the same time, about 600 million years ago, um, extraordinarily old and conserved. We know it's super important because it's been around for that long. Incredible, probably the best antioxidant able to sap up um, reactive oxygen species better than most things because... Um, unlike vitamin C, where it can take one um, one free radical and then it itself becomes a free radical, the ascorbyl radical, melatonin, uh, the molecule that is made after it scavenges one, is also an antioxidant, and then it's it's the one that scavenges after that is also an antioxidant. So it is an extremely strong thing. But I think again, it's just it's just a proxy marker for better mitochondrial function. Uh, I think that's that's what it's doing, and it's it's probably doing. 500 other things at the same time. But fundamentally, I think the reason it's going up is because the mitochondria are just working better. And that's to be expected, I suppose. I mean, we know that it works better uh, with near infrared, but getting to this story, and, and this is, you know, being Australians, this this really hits home. Um, this, the, the narrative is extremely dangerous and it's killing people. Um, that's just how it is. The way I don't even blame the dermatologists, to be honest. I think the reason we've got here is the same reason, the same story with rickets and cod liver oil. We we just we got too into the weeds that we lost we lost the context. We we zoomed in too far and we no longer realize what it is that we're looking at at all. We've lost the forest for the trees. And when I before I started the podcast, my first planned podcast was with a vitamin D researcher here in Australia, and they declined to do the podcast. They said they'd speak with me, but they didn't want to be recorded because th they stated quite clearly that they can't be talking about this stuff because the people in the Cancer Council ha are very, very powerful in how grant money gets given out, and they don't want to, re they don't want to risk their reputation being done by saying, hey, you actually do need sunlight. And that was a big wake-up call for me, like, wow, there are actually powers that be here that are pushing a narrative, like there actually is a narrative. And I understand why. I mean, if you're, on, if you're the head of the Cancer Council who's been saying any amount of sun is going to kill you for, you know, decades, you know, are you really going to turn around and say, hey, actually, we got that completely wrong and we've probably caused thousands and thousands of deaths as a result of our messaging? You know, you, of course, they're going to double down and say, no, we're, of course, we're right. And they'll have the same tagline. There's nothing healthy about a tan, which is so non-scientific. I can't even wrap my head around it. You know, a toddler could tell you, have a look, anyone who is pale, you know, <laughs> your, your grandma says, oh, are you feeling okay? You know, are you, are you sick? People who are tan, they say, wow, you're glowing. You look really healthy. I mean, forget about science. We know, we know that tanning is a sign of health. I mean, that's just, a toddler knows that. Um, but, you know, really what's happened is scientism has got in the way of real science. 
And, you know, we use, for goodness sake, we use murine models. We use mice to study this stuff. First of all, they're nocturnal um, and they're, they're furry. Then Their skin's not supposed to be exposed to, to sunlight. To narrowband um, UV, UV lamps. To narrowband UV. And then, and then they use solar simulators. I don't know if you've seen these solar simulators. I asked this vitamin D researcher, I said, what's the spectrum on these things? It's about 10% UV. Nowhere on this planet do you get 10% UV. It's just, it's absolutely ridiculous. And of course, they don't have the balancing long wavelengths to accompany them because, you know, these are, these are energy efficient, you know, lighting scenarios. And they're in a, they're in a, you know, cage. They're not grounded. You know, they're surrounded by Wi-Fi. You know, for goodness sake, you couldn't get further away from a, a model that is going to tell you anything about the real world. Uh, and then to top that off, we know that all of those all of those early murine models were tainted by the fact that these mice had papillomaviruses that caused melanoma. You know, the whole thing was tainted from the beginning, but no one ever knows that story that the original studies were tainted, and no one is talking about the fact that even sunburn increases your risk of living when you get melanoma. It's a it's a predict it's a predictor of better health outcomes. Sunburn, you know, which no one should be striving for. Um, we know the biggest studies of their kind, the mel uh, the melanoma in southern Sweden cohort, set out to find over twenty years ago why they their whole thing was find out why why sunlight causes cancer, particularly melanoma. They found the exact opposite, the exact opposite. Massive cohort, over twenty thousand people. And they found the exact opposite. Even the people who smoked, lifelong smokers that got the most sun exposure, lived longer than the non-smokers who had the least sun exposure. You know, th this idea that we're calling sunlight, and, and we, we can't say sunlight is carcinogenic. UV light, man-made UV light can be carcinogenic. Let's, let's be very clear about that. If it's any time you take light outside of the balance of the natural environment, you're playing with fire. And that's why I'm not particularly a fan of UV tanning beds because all you get is this narrow band UVB. Can be useful, sure, but you're running a risk. And you know, there's there's no translational capacity with the the studies that have been done. And of course, here's the other thing: it's it's considered unethical to have a study where you purposefully expose humans to sunlight. You know, it's it's considered unethical because they think it's carcinogenic. So you can't get those studies where you say, let's get a group of people, tell them to live outside as much as possible and get another group of people to say, keep doing what you're doing and then see the health outcomes. You can't do that because it's seen as unethical. You know, it's just, it's it's beyond ridiculous. And I, 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 I'm aware I, I sound quite passionate right now. And that's because, you know, I've I've had family members who have died of melanoma. Um, it's, it's unacceptable that we're treating it the way that we are saying that the sun causes it when all of the evidence suggests that the story is not even remotely that simple. Um, and we know that, um, exposure that you, the use of sunscreen increases your risk of non-melanoma skin cancer because you're able to stay out in the sun longer than you should. You know, erythema, the reddening of the skin is the sign, Hey, maybe you need to get into the shade right now. Right. As Jack Cruz says, lions and hippos know to go in the shade in the heat of the day. You know, they don't need any science to tell them that. And that's what our bodies are doing. You know, when you get that reddening, you go out of the sun. It's very simple. But, you know, the use of sunscreens, even the use of artificial artificial light, particularly particularly at night, um, the, the just because it's blue, it's right next to ultraviolet on the in the spectrum. These are really high energy photons. And they penetrate quite deep, which is why those those visible wavelengths are what causes basal cell carcinoma. Um, so when you're you know you're sitting in your office all day under fluorescent tube lighting, thinking, "Oh, I'm glad I'm not outside getting UV light," <laughs> you know, like you're not you're not really understanding that the fact that those visible wavelengths are really high energy photons as well, and they're penetrating really deep, and because they're not balanced by the the red, the near infrared, and the infrared. You know, your your mitochondria are, are fundamentally not liking that. And it's I think it's quite clear that use of sunscreen increases risk of basal cell carcinoma because of that it's precise phenomena. 
you're blocking out the UV, but you're allowing the visible, the high energy visible photons to be interacting with your skin for so much longer than they should, you, you've uncoupled the system. And I think as soon as we can get studies where the system is coupled and you get people exposed to sunlight naturally and not artificial light, then we can start to make inferences. But this idea that the sun is toxic or harmful for your health really has to be turned around. And I think, um, I think that's uh, probably my big mission with what I'm doing is to help people understand that light really matters and that sunlight is our birthright and being able to live. I mean, we all know it feels good. You know, um, it's, it's giving us, like Jack says, the complete compounding pharmacy. It's the whole thing. It has every wavelength in it that we need. Um, and I, yeah, it, it upsets me quite a bit to see this narrative, um, particularly when there is so much evidence to the contrary. There's so much evidence to the contrary. It's almost unbelievable. And it's, it's going to take a long time to turn the ship around, but I think young people are going to start to realize, well, hang on. We've never lived more away from the influence of sun in our entire evolutionary past, yet we've never had more melanoma and non-melanoma skin cancer. Make that make sense for me, because it doesn't make sense at all. Um, you know, and I'd love to speak to dermatologists. I mean, um, I sent you that article about the Australians of the year who, you know, pale as all get out, um, talking about why you should never go out in the sun because they're melanoma researchers. It's very upsetting that that we bestow awards upon people like this who are, in in my view, and I, I suspect yours, probably harming people with that advice. Um, I will I will uh, contain my diatribe to there because I could go on forever because it's something I'm very passionate about and people really need to get a grasp on. I I share your passion because in terms of what we're trying to convey with the health benefits of light, natural sunlight. The UV sun causes melanoma and you know avoid the sun because of those reasons is the biggest obstacle in terms of getting people out and into an environment which they can begin to reap these benefits of, of healthy sunlight. That, that's why I respect the work of um, Professor Weller with his UK Biobank study and, and Pelle Lindquist with his Melanoma in Southern Sweden study because those are large long longitudinal population based yes observational studies but they've showed that unequivocally that the more sun someone gets the more ultraviolet light someone gets the lower their all cause mortality the lower their cancer mortality the lower their cardiovascular mortality so we're really trading off the the, mel the melanoma researching kind of um, apparatus and the anti-sun messaging narrative is really making a risk versus benefit trade-off on behalf of the population that um, your cardiovascular mortality doesn't matter. Your total cancer mortality doesn't matter. Instead, what we think matters is your prevention of melanoma, yet they're not even correct on that On that, for the reasons that you've just talked about. So this is um, you know, grand scale um, harm of people because the fact of the matter is that more people are dying from cardiovascular disease, more people are dying from bowel cancer and breast cancer, um, lung cancer, than they're, they're dying from, from, from melanoma. So not to diminish the, the seriousness of that condition, but the advice around the primary prevention of, this, of melanoma is misguided. And, and you can look at studies that show increased vitamin D is protective of prognosis in diagnosed melanoma, meaning that people that had the high vitamin D had less invasive tumors, they had less likely to metastasize. So if UV light makes vitamin D, then you know, as you've pointed out, Cameron, square that for us. I'm happy to talk to anyone who's who can square that circle for me. Um, the reality is that melanoma, just like those other cancers, is um, is a problem when the immune system is impaired from a low vitamin. D level and low ambient, um, low sunlight exposure. So the paradoxical implication is that 
uh, it's well, once you have a melanoma diagnosis, getting that vitamin D level up um, as soon as you can <laughs> becomes your priority. And you know, mm. connect two dots about how to get your um, vitamin D level up in the most healthy way. So this whole story is has been um, butchered, and people have been misguided. And that's why I'm so excited to release my course about how to build um, a, a healthy and safe solar callus, because it's going to go in depth about all the nuances and the topics that we have a lot that we've mentioned on this podcast, but also how to use it in the sun in an ancestrally appropriate manner. And I'm not diminishing the fact that um, UV light yield and skin type is you know, the main associated risk factor. And we need to be careful and we need to be judicious, but um, there's so much more advice that people need in order to be able to harness this you know, giant fusion reactor in the sky um, for the inarguable um, health benefits. Yeah, it's it's like the advice we're given is like the worst trade deal ever. It's like you receive, you get increased risk of basically every single disease and you get protection from perhaps the skin cancers that don't metastasize. Like that's it. <laughs> uh, it's the worst trade deal ever. Um, it's the worst thing you could possibly imagine. Um, but just the way that the way that it's messaged is is has become so ingrained it's and so powerful and you know i'm i'm so glad you're doing you're talking about solar callus um most people have no idea how how well they can actually tan when they when they actually do the right things it's so easy to switch that around some people burn like instantly it's it's quite remarkable um when they you know they live uh you know they they're night owls they stay up till all hours of the night you know, they eat the standard diet, um, you know, they're doing all of the things that basically aren't helping their skin prepare to actually interact with the environment the way that it's meant to. But you'd be surprised, like, how even um, people with light skin can tolerate the sun, even here in Australia. Um, it is, yeah, it's remarkable how long you can actually be out there without getting the burn. Um, and as, as far as I'm aware, um, it's not even the skin type. It's actually hair color matters more than skin color with regard to risk to of skin cancer. Um, and I found that to be absolutely fascinating. I should be doing a podcast soon with a, a skin cancer researcher or a retired skin skin cancer researcher who um, goes over all of this stuff about um, you know all the things we just spoke about how sunlight decreases your risk of skin cancers um, and decreases your mortality if you do get one. Um, and yeah, a, apparently, she tells me, uh, hair color is more important than skin color, which I found to be fascinating because um, because of the melanin story. And obviously, there are different types of melanin. And, you know, we uh, regrettably, we didn't get to talk about um, how melanin is a semiconductor and, and what the implications of that are. Um, but yeah, that's that might be a conversation for another day. But you know, all of this stuff goes so deep, and it's so incredibly fascinating. Yes, it is. It's and look, as Australians, I think we're uniquely placed to have this discussion because Queensland yeah. is the melanoma capital of 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 the world. Australia has a massive um, disproportionate um, incidence of of um, melanoma, and New Zealand obviously as well. But the I can attest. You know, and you can too, having grown up uh, in this country, that the way that people are using the sun is not respecting an ancestral, the ancestral um, niche that we've spent, you know, an hour and a half talking about. And that is um, the fact that, you know, when you go to the beach and no one has got, as a kid, no one has got morning sun. No one has exposed their skin to red and, and infrared from, from natural full spectrum morning sunlight. And um, you, you, you know, it's 10, 11 a.m. The UV index is, is, you know, raging already. You lather on all this, um, you know, UVA, UVB blocking sunscreens. Um, and, you know, you hop out in the sun and you play in the surf for, for four hours. And that, that, that is how most people are using the sun. And, you know, eating a standard Australian diet with, with those non-edible food products you mentioned called seed oils. Yeah, um, I was going to say, and then after the beach, you go and get deep fried fish and chips and go home and have a few beers and stay up in the, watching the telly in, in the LED lighting that you've got. 
you know, it's a perfect storm. You, I couldn't have, I couldn't have made it better myself if I was the devil. You know, you you couldn't do anything better than that. So, so part of this change is the education, and and again, I'm going to talk about this in depth in, in my course for those who are interested. But it, it involves us mimicking how we would have got ultraviolet light in our ancestral past, which is it was never you you never have the main without the entree. You never have ultraviolet without first having having uh, red and infrared, and that reduces erythema. It increases the the ability of the skin's the skin layer to tolerate ultraviolet light. It increases mitochondrial function and collagen production uh, and stimulates healing. So not only by bookending ultraviolet exposure and getting it progressive with UVA, then UVB, you're not only preparing the skin, but you're also healing any kind of um, damage or burn that um, might have have occurred during that sun exposure period. So um, yes, it's it's a big um, narrative and a big education effort, but what is the goal? The goal is to stop people dying. <laughs> the goal is to stop people getting cardiovascular disease and getting cancer diagnoses, um, and not just myopically focusing on um, you know me- melanoma skin cancer. When, uh, as I said to to Richard Weller, it's like focusing on the mouse when there's a you know woolly mammoth in the room next to you. Like, w- yep. where's the proportionality here? Um, and that yep. is uh, that's a, that's a job as a generalist is to be able to look at the total risk and the, the, the big picture of health and um, help to direct people's attention to the the biggest um, the biggest fish the biggest uh, <laughs> woolly mammoth standing in the room. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And um, I, you know, to me, I think the goal. I set the goal. I set the bar even lower. Um, I, I think if we can just turn the narrative around. You know, some people are not going to listen, even provided with the information. Uh, I think as long as people are informed adequately, and there isn't a nefarious narrative spreading um, ideas that are fundamentally wrong and dangerous, um, you know, people will do with that what they need. Um, and I just, I just think it's important that in the culture that we have here, it is acknowledged that sunlight is important and not toxic not just a priori toxic. Um, if we can get that far, I'll, I'll be, I'll be, uh, you know, over the moon about just that, not even saving lives just yet, but you know, that will come down the track. Yeah. Amazing. Well, Cameron, it's been a a fascinating conversation. Thanks for, for the discussion. We've covered a a very, very wide range of topics and uh, it's, it's thoroughly enjoyable. So I will encourage everyone who's listening to check out Cameron's podcast, um, the Ricky Flow Nutrition Podcast, and, and his amazing previous episodes, a lot of whom I've I've interviewed as, as well. So, um, Cameron, how can people connect with you? How can they find out what you're doing? And um, let us know any final parting thoughts um, that you have. Yeah, so the, I, I encourage people to start with the podcast. It's sort of my baby. Um, it's not not nearly as popular as yours, but um, oh, yeah. it's growing slowly. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm hoping this year I'm going to speak to a lot of uh, a lot of very interesting people um, about the types of things that we spoke about today. Um, I'm on social media. Instagram is probably what I'm what I'm using most, um, and I have a website that has. Um, you know, some ideas about reading material and, and things like that. Um, and yeah, that's probably the best place to, to find me and to reach out if you, if you need to contact me at all. Um, but yeah, probably just the podcast. If you can, um, yeah, if you can listen to that, that would be, that would be fantastic. Great. Um, yeah. And I just want to say thank you for inviting me on. It's uh, quite a pleasure to be on the uh, interviewee side of things. Um, makes me feel very special. Yeah, awesome, mate. All right, we'll uh, we'll talk soon. And yeah, thanks again. No worries. Thank you, Max.